on our discoveries. I saw the story. I was about to say the poem about it, but that's not it. story.
2548, but it's old. So should it be counting now? Oh, see, let's see. Hold on, Claude. You came here for a reading, not a <laughs> Or maybe I won't bother recording this one at all. It will just, uh, we'll just let it to be. It will be. You will be the only. There we go. There we go. I didn't want to get that tweet. That's okay. <laughs> There's, uh, hello everyone. There's a lot of pressure on this particular story because two days ago, ReaderCon tweeted, whoever's behind the ReaderCon Twitter feed, I think we just found the best title of any story being read at the convention. It's like, oh great, now let's hope the story has anything to it as opposed to just the title. This is a story that is on submission uh, and therefore unpublished, and the title of the story is the pillow of disappointment and what was found beneath it. Uh, and, and so the story begins. It was only as his heart loved up its glance and his vision narrowed to a tightly focused circle of light that Breck, for the first time, saw the tooth fairy whose affections had long escaped him. He felt himself being pulled down the tunnel toward the end of the but before he could be fully in its presence, where he swore he would have answers for his many decades of torment, he relived in a flash the life which had brought him to that moment, a flash that seemed to last as long as the lifetime which had preceded it, and which was no less soul-crushing. His journey, or at least the part of the journey that mattered, began with envy. It started the day his younger brother Jess had held up the first of his baby teeth that had fallen out and explained to Breck what their father had told him earlier, that if left under his pillow overnight, that tooth would be replaced by a present. Breck, confused, looked back and forth from the sudden gap of his brother's smile to the small tooth in his palm. Then he snatched it away from Jess, and as he held it over his head, fending off his leaping brother, he marveled at the tiny fragment of bone and wondered, why had their father never told him such a thing could occur? Wasn't it until later that night as Brent tucked into a bed across from Jess in the room they still shared and watched as his brother reverently placed the tooth beneath his pillow that he wondered something else, something far more puzzling. Why had he never learned it was even possible for a tooth to fall out until this event had occurred to his little brother, who after all was three years a junior? What was wrong with his own teeth that they remained firmly in place? He lay in bed, running his tongue over his teeth, the only teeth he had ever known, even though, based on what Jess had told him, they should have been long gone and mostly replaced. He looked over to his brother's side of the room and kept his eyes wide in the grainy moonlight for the arrival of the tooth fairy. He needed to see the exchange of tooth for gift, an exchange which had yet been denied him and which by all rights should have been his first. Instead, he fell asleep witnessing nothing but childish dreams of his own teeth falling out, hitting the floor and transforming on impact into toys while Jess looked on in amazement, until he was awoken by the sound of his actual brother dancing around the room in his pajamas, a shiny coin over his head. Having missed the magical visit and seen his brother rewarded, Breck felt doubly cheated. After he brushed that morning, counting carefully as their family dentist had instructed him to do, he couldn't help but stare in the mirror at his perfectly spaced, blindingly white teeth. So bright they were, he almost couldn't bear to look at them, but he also couldn't bear to look away. He stared so long his mother had to shoo him out of the bathroom for fear he'd miss his school bus. Greg usually begrudged riding along with his brother, but that morning the opposite was true. Instead of seeking out a seat as far away from Jess as possible, he plopped down beside him and set out to make a deal. For the next tooth that fell out, Breck offered to pay twice what their parents had told Jess the tooth fairy would give in order that he might claim it at his own. Jess demanded he throw in two of his favorite comic books, but Breck didn't quibble. This had suddenly become far too important to him, and the deal was done. During the weeks that followed, Breck grew impatient, waiting for his brother's tooth to loosen and took to examining Jess's mouth after each meal to make sure the detachment had already happened and the prize accidentally swallowed. The parents were pleased at what seemed to be the brothers' sudden closeness, though they had no idea of the reason behind it, and Breck made sure they didn't find out, shushing Jess whenever it seemed he was about to explain. When Jess finally came up to him one afternoon on the school bus home to show him an even wider gap in his smile, followed by a tooth in his hand, 
Breck felt the night to be impossibly far away. He carried that tooth clasp tightly in his hand the whole of the day, fearful one of his parents might throw it away as trash if he left it on a shelf, or that he'd lose it if placed in a pocket. When it was finally time for bed, he shoved the tooth under his pillow as he had seen his brother do weeks earlier, though with far more excitement, for his, after all, was a world turned upside down. And then he waited, sure he could feel the tooth through the pillow beneath his head, even though he knew it was impossible to do so. He wanted to see the transaction occur, but somehow knew, not knowing how he knew, that it could only happen while he slept. So he struggled to drift away, but found it as difficult as if it were Christmas Eve. When morning finally came, he snapped awake with no memory of having fallen asleep. The moment the sun shot through the window to his eyes, he lifted the pillow, his heart thumping, and discovered disappointment. For there was not a coin as if the light of his brother, but rather a second tooth, side by side with the first, one barely distinguishable from the other. He had no idea what this meant. Had the tooth fairy's response to his substitution of Jess's tooth for his own been to return his brother's initial offering? He showed them both to Jess, expecting his brother to easily be able to identify whether or not they'd both been his, but his only response, after offering up future teeth that Greg wanted to make some of deals, was to call him weird. <laughs> but Greg decided there would be no more deals, because it was obvious, wasn't it? The tooth fairy would clearly only accept the tooth of Greg's own making, which was a problem, because as the preceding weeks had startlingly exposed to him, he had never lost one. Remembering all the advice his dentist had ever given, he knew what he had to do next, which was ignore it all as best as he could. He stopped eating carrots and apples, pocketing them while he only pretended to chew, and instead began gobbling down candy apples and jujubes, peanut butter and jawbreakers, caramels and root beer barrels, putting his allowance toward anything he could think of which might cause a tooth to rot or crack. <laughs> He stopped brushing each morning and evening, instead running the water in the bathroom and making gurgling noises to fool his parents into believing he was unchanged. When at night he'd discover a raisin, or better yet, a fragment of a jelly bean, or even better than both, a head of a gummy bear, which had survived the day stuck between his teeth, he was delighted. He prayed for the healthy tooth beside each sugary treat to become riddled with cavities, but somehow, each morning when he woke, all evidence of the previous day's candy bits would be gone. His teeth seemed healthier than the day before, gleaming as if he just returned from the dentist after cleaning. He'd study each tooth in the morning mirror and find no stain, tap each and find no sign of wobble. He realized he'd have to make more strenuous efforts if he wanted what all others had seemingly already experienced. He began by forging his father's signature on a permission slip and joining his school's junior football team. He had no interest in the game, but he knew what playing it would mean for his mouth. <laughs> he pretended to wear the guard his coach handed out to each of the players and headed out for his practices with a smile he hoped would be absent on his return. But no matter how many times he was tackled, his teeth remained as tight as it bolted in place. He signed up for all the other sports the school offered, baseball, soccer, wrestling. When in the thick of it, he aimed himself at any elbow or ball that came his way, but nothing. His teammates faced with such collisions became battered and bloody, but Breck's smile was untarnished. He wished it was winter so he could see what ice hockey could do for him, because he'd learned from television what the game had done to the professional players, and yet at the same time he knew it would have been as useless an attempt as all the rest. Breck's affliction, for that's what he thought of it as, was evident only to himself at first, but once he entered high school, it became evident to all, for though he grew, his teeth did not. They became too small for his face, or rather, he'd become too large for them. And though they were perfect, their stable size within his growing jaw gave the impression they'd worn away the nubs. The girls would laugh and turn away, which was bad enough, but the boys would laugh and come closer to taunt. Piranha boy, mushmouth. Bite me. Oh, that's right, you can. And then the, then the pushing and shoving would begin. He had to find a way to make it stop. He begged Jess to help, not with the substitution of swap teeth, for he no longer thought of the prize such a trade would buy, but only of freedom for what he presented to the world every time he opened his mouth. Besides, his brother had long since lost them all. 
Now, what he needed was aid with attempts at extractions he knew he could not ask of others and could not perform alone. Jess agreed, no longer needing to be bribed with money or comic books, as he was embarrassed to be seen with Greg and wanted it as much as he and wanted as much as he did for it, whatever it was, to be over. Greg remained still while Jess used every tool from the farmer's collection, hammering, drilling, and sawing, succeeding with none of those implements but dulling them all. Tying a string around one of Greg's teeth and tethering the other end to their parents' car before driving off only resulted in a damaged rear bumper they had difficulty in explaining. <laughs> and as for leaving from the roof of their garage, well, let's just say Greg's ankles were not as sturdy as his incisors. Whatever craziness they tried failed, and soon Jess was no longer willing to try because they had drifted or rather were pushed apart, and why not? His brother had grown and was ready for grown-up things, but though Greg had grown, his teeth did not, he had become a freak, unfit for the company of others. He dropped out of college, for he could tell that even his professors had trouble stomaching him, and besides, no diploma would ever be large enough to mask his ailment. He tried to get a job. He needed money for what he saw as what had to come next, but no one would hire him. No one wanted to share an office with a man whose baby teeth had never fallen out. He ended up working in a series of temporary jobs that could be handled at home over the telephone as a telemarketer, survey taker, medical billing processor, any position in which he could thrive by voice alone. Eventually, he earned enough money to see a specialist. His family dentist had been useless, and Breck knew he needed something more. His parents had never agreed to it, no matter how much he begged, both because of the cost and because they insisted their boy was perfect in every way. But as soon as he had the savings to fund the oral surgery he felt necessary, he went. The doctor ran tests, but failed to find any explanation for Breck's condition. X-rays revealed no other teeth waiting behind his baby teeth to rise or drop. Those who were visible were all the teeth he had. Pull them, Breck insisted, replace them with implants. But his request only made the doctor shudder. It would be a crime, he said, because they were so beautiful. He'd no more remove them than saw off an Olympian's legs. Breck looked up from the chair in horror at the doctor's worshipful expression and knew, just knew, he had no better luck elsewhere. So instead of pressing further or seeking out another doctor, he instead asked the man to sculpt an appliance which would slip over his real teeth in order that he could present a different face to the world. Breck saw a disappointment in the man's eyes that he would wish to hide his teeth away, but he acquiesced, if only to prevent him from attempting a more violent solution that might damage them. And there was disappointment in Breck's heart as he realized that what mattered to the doctor most wasn't Breck, but his damn teeth. The first time he left the doctor's office, looking as he felt the rest of the human race look, the acrylic shattered before he could reach the lobby and when he returned to display the debris that had fallen out into his hands, the doctor could only scratch his head. The second time Greg tried to make his way home, the false teeth literally melted away, and Greg returned to the office holding out a waxy puddle in his cupped hands. The doctor sighed and asked whether Greg was sure he wanted to go through with this, that these material failures were surely of his own subconscious making. Greg demanded he try again, and he did, but this time, none of the equipment in the office would function. Machines failed to turn on, or they jammed, or made noises of protest no machine should make, or, or caused the office to fill with smoke. After that last attempt, as they sat out in the hallway waiting for the office air to clear, the doctor told Breck, enough was enough. There'd be no more tries. Breck should be happy to have any teeth at all, especially those teeth. Go, have a life, it could be worse. But Breck didn't think so. Yes, he could live, but what good was a life when he couldn't love the things that made life worth living? On the rare occasions a woman would get past the look of him and agree to date, seeing food slide through his teeth and down his chin as he ate would send him running. And no man wanted to hang out with him, not bowl or shoot darts or grab a beer, not even when he was gener enough, generous about buying the next round, because once they heard his story, it would repulse them. Thank goodness for pets who needed nothing more than the sound of a can opener to ignore his flaws and at least pretend to love him. When stepping out from his apartment, he tried never to smile or even speak, preferring that people thought him mute to the unpalatable truth. 
But even in taking that measure, though, it couldn't last long, for he soon felt unable to breathe through his nose. There was never an apparent irritant, but his nostrils would suddenly become stuffed, a state that existed no other time except for when he tried to hide his condition that way. Sometimes he tried to escape by going to the movies. He'd sit in the glow of the screen, searching for solace there, or even a momentary distraction, but he found he could never pay attention to the plot. He would never lose himself as others did because he just stared at those giant teeth and be filled with envy, an envy that reminded him of his initial envy, the day his brother showed him that first tooth, summoning up all the heartache that came after. Darkness became his friend, cloaking his misery and soothing somewhat, but only somewhat, his pain. He started taking long walks at night, where he found at first that his face hurt from relaxing its muscles after the tightness and tension of keeping his lips sealed all day. But the relief would only be momentary. He had to return to the light, and to the mirror, and to the many reminders that he had been cursed, and to the constant wondering, when would it all end? The day came when he admitted what he should have admitted much earlier, that there would only be an answer to his question if he answered it himself. Eventually, he decided he had enough. He removed his headset in the middle of one of his calls, not caring that he left the customer hanging, a customer whose teeth were surely commensurate to his life, and took an elevator to the top floor of his apartment building, where he then climbed a long, narrow staircase up to the roof. He sat on the edge, dangling his feet over the side, and looking down on the people who wore the teeth he was supposed to wear, who had the life he was supposed to lead. Wasn't fair, none of it. And all his attempts, such as most recently, when his efforts to dislodge with hammer and pliers only succeeded in spraining his wrists, had taught him there would only ever be one possible cure. And this was a place to receive that cure, high in the air, higher by far than the top of their parents' garage, high enough to end it all. Another kind of person might have been able to continue living this way, Brett knew, could have embraced his birthright as some kind of sick gift, maybe even become a viral star of sorts, but he also knew he was not that other kind of person. With a nod and a tight lipped smile, he slid from the roof and dropped to the street below, where an ice cream truck, its driver unable to stop in time, ran over his crumpled body and dragged him half a block, shredding him against the pavement. A crowd gathered around the period he thought he had placed at the end of the sentence of his life, and some could not bear to look at the wreckage made of his body and turned away in tears and revulsion, while others could. And as the final flickering of his consciousness faded, he could hear, nonsensically, that in the midst of the carnage they were startled by the unblemished perfection of his teeth. And once that recap of his life was over, in a flash there was no flash to him, and his life, or rather his life after death, resumed, there it was, the tooth fairy, staring at him with an admiration that perplexed Breck, considering the emotions which raged through him and the first words to come out of his mouth, why do you hate me so? Breck asked. Hank, no, exclaimed the tooth fairy. Its cloak, which looked like nothing so much as a child's blanket, drifting this way and that in the misty nowhere of their meeting ground as he entered, he trembled with delight. I could never hate you, not you. But look what you did to my life. Look what you made me do to my life. And then to be whole again in this place, outside of places, rather than back on the pavement where I belong, that has to be hatred. I've done nothing to your life, the tooth fairy said. I, I could do nothing to your life. It would break the laws of nature for me to have touched you. Look at you. You're unique in all the history of time. Your teeth are perfect. Absolutely, undeniably, irrefutably perfect. Breck reached up, ran his fingers in horror along his gum line. But, but what? You, you, Breck tried or tried to say, then finally, as a surprise turned to disappointment, turned to resignation. So. Even though I'm dead, I must still go on like this. I'm going to wear these teeth forever. I thought that at least once dead, I'd be made whole. Please don't think of it that way, said the tooth fairy. You are whole. This is no curse you've been given. You've been blessed. Why couldn't you see it that way? Why couldn't the world let you see it that way? I only wish I had been worthy of such perfection. But I was not. I've been proven second best. The Tooth Fairy grinned ruefully then, and Breck could indeed see that the god's teeth, if the Tooth Fairy can be considered a god, held before his own. It briefly gave Breck a perverse sense of pride, but one that winked out as the Tooth Fairy continued, which means that you, Breck, you are the Tooth Fairy now. You're out of your mind. 
said Greg, backing away, even though there was nowhere to back away to. How much torture do you believe I can stand? A lifetime which would be enough, don't you think? You want me to help others get what I could not? See them achieve a happiness I never could have? Are you really that cruel? This is not going to happen. We have no choice in this, I'm afraid, said the tooth fairy, bowing its head, but not before one last look at Breck's unparalleled teeth. It cannot be denied. You are what you are, and I was what I was, and what I was, you see, is no more. The tooth fairy began to fade, its expression wistful but happy. Wait, shouted Greg, come back, I don't want this, I don't accept this. Goodbye, Greg, said the tooth fairy, its cloak huddling on misty ground where it once were its feet. Don't go yet, cried Greg, feeling lost, feeling found. You haven't told me enough, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And suddenly, in the saying of it, Greg knew exactly what he was supposed to do. <coughs> Greg stood in the far corner of a bedroom as a small boy patted his pillow, knowing what was underneath, knowing, or so he thought, what was to come. Hidden by the shadows and emotions whirling on this first night of the first day of the new life that had been thrust upon him, Greg waited for his supplicant to fall asleep. It wouldn't be good for the child to see him. No one should see coming the moment which will change his life, especially the young, for whom each second should be allowed to remain a surprise and Breck imagined that from now on he would be full of surprises. Once the boy was out, his breathing slow and even, Breck stepped forward, slipped his hand beneath the pillow, and received a tooth not one hundredth as beautiful as the least of his own. The child's offering offended him. Breck suspected he would always be offended as he circled the globe without rest, chasing the darkness one bedroom endlessly, replacing the next. The tooth fairy who had come before him had been correct. No tooth could compare to his own, and in the witness of this and all that would follow, he knew only the reason for his discontent would change. His despair, however, would remain undiminished. But now, at last, now at least, there would be a purpose. He tossed the flawed tooth into his mouth and swallowed as he immediately understood what he was meant to do. He then rummaged beneath his cloak, that cloak which looked not just like a child's blanket, but like all children's blankets at once, to find the proper reward. Surely not a coin or a bill such as what parents would put beneath pillows when the tooth fairy was too busy to get to a particular child's bedroom personally, even no Santa Claus after all, and couldn't quite be everywhere at once. Besides, for a tooth like that, even a quarter would have been too rich. Perhaps some overcooked vegetables. A few Brussels sprouts would be nice. A broken whistle? Maybe a tiny toy truck with wheels that would always fall off. Ah, uh, wait, he knew a sheet from a forgotten homework assignment due the following morning. Perfect. Greg slid the page beneath the pillow and stepped back into the shadows. He wished he could wait to see the child's response, even though he knew that if the child happened to wake before he had gone, his glowing teeth would give away his presence. Besides, he had many more stops to make, many more hopes to collect. Revenge, thought the tooth fairy, is sweet. He smiled, his teeth lying the room airing, but luckily not likely to cause cavities. With that, embracing what he had become, Breck tightened what was now his cloak of disappointment about his shoulders and was gone, already of thinking of what thinking of what lay beneath the next pillow and all the pillows to come. <laughs> Thank you very much. And with that I yield, I am beyond my time by a minute or two. So thank you very much for coming. If there are any questions, I'll take them out in the hallway. Sorry I didn't make you cry this time. That's okay. You made me laugh. That's just as good. Is <laughs> your No.